at the Lido. Bar, oh sure, this must be in Venice. This is also so. in Lido. Which, yeah. <laughs> no, it's supposed to be the Lido, uh, is it? Uh, yeah, residence. And I guess those are the, it's, um, I, I might be apartments behind the uh, cabana things, the, uh, oh. you know, in, uh, on the beach there. The other one's supposed to be Istanbul, on the right. This is also Venice, maybe? No, it's in... Uh... St. Petersburg. Wow. Peter the Great. Huh. How are we doing on time? Is it 11? Or... Hmm. Wow. For the catalog. Oh, beautiful.
the foghorn? along with folk and outsider art and illustrated books. After briefly working at the Baltimore Museum of Art, he spent over 30 years of his career as the curator in charge at the Achenbach Graphic Arts Foundation at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. He has also taught extensively at the San Francisco Art Institute, the California College of Arts and Crafts, Stanford University, the University of California at Santa Cruz, and at the University of San Francisco. He has curated over 150 exhibitions in his career and continues to be engaged in the arts community as a writer, a lecturer, an art advisor, and as a collector. In today's lecture, he will share more about his unique collection that he used to put together Contemplating Character and also the development of the exhibition. And hopefully at the end of his lecture, there will be uh, some time for questions. So one last reminder to please silence. My exhibition here at the Society of Four Arts it looks beautiful and I'm very appreciative. Um, I also want to mention uh, my friends Stuart and Beverly Denver that are here from Los Angeles who are some of the backers and supporters of the show. Uh, Stuart's uh, brother and wife are here uh, and, uh, and also uh, Carol Leaf, my friend who lives here in Palm Beach to welcome them to my lecture this morning. The nature of portraiture is one that goes back all the way to the pharaohs where the pharaohs had their portraits, their likenesses carved in stone to show their power and prestige. Portraiture, up until the last 200 years or so, has been the province of people of wealth or power or religious, religious conviction, uh, rich people, the royalty, and the church. And so the, the nature of the portrait was a uh, was a ramification of the importance of that individual, either because of their wealth or their, their power within the society they lived in. Um, there are exceptions, and the exceptions are the works that you very often see in museums, such as the work we see on the screen this morning here. This is Albert Durer. Albert Durer was not such a shy guy that he didn't portray himself as Christ, as you see in this picture. Um, <laughs> Uh, Durer had a, was very fond of himself, uh, and he had a right to be, because he was the greatest uh, German artist of the Renaissance. And uh, this is a, uh, a, an image of, of total confidence and uh, uh, his, his sense of self. But it's, you have portraits that seem out of time. This, is, uh, this portrait by Vermeer is about seven inches high. It's in the National Gallery of Washington. It's about seven inches high by about five inches, about the size of a paperback book. And it is uh, essentially a Dutch 17th century snapshot. We don't know who the sitter is. The sitter is of no importance. The sitter that, that, uh, that uh, Vermeer captured the, the kind of essence of a person as if they just briefly turned and looked at the artist and he's captured the sense of of immediacy and light. It has the spontaneity that's amazing. There's nothing quite like it. Uh, there's a show at the uh, Rijks Museum in Amsterdam right now of uh, 35 or 37 Vermeers. It's the largest exhibition of Vermeer ever put together. And the 
show opened about three weeks ago and it's completely sold out. So you're gonna have to go on eBay if you want to go to see the show and buy a ticket. But uh, you know, I mean, Vermeer's as popular as Taylor Swift these days, it seems, <laughs> when it comes to tickets sales. Um, but Vermeer, again, is, is a telling portraits are the portraits he did of himself. This is a portrait of uh, a reverend late in life, uh, uh, looking uh, like he's had a few miles on his tires there. And uh, he, he, he's not trying to impress anybody. Interestingly, when you see his early self-portraits, they show a man on the move, they show a man who's full of ambition and self-confidence and all that, and here he is at the end of his life, and he's been through, uh, uh, he's been through the, the death of his wife, uh, the death of his, uh, of his mistress, uh, and I think the death of his son too, and uh, a bankruptcy, and he's, uh, he's kind of at peace with himself, uh, and painting himself in a world worry uh, look. And, and again, uh, certain institutions understand, not the society before us, but other institutions understand, is that because it has, uh, it has a, a catchy title, contemplating character, uh, it also is a portrait. And most people think of portraits as things uh, of their relatives that they don't want to inherit. Uh, uh, <laughs> That, you know, portraits of, 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 of forgotten bank presidents and college, uh, college, uh, college provosts and stuff like that. But in the history of art, uh, even the art market tips its hat to portraiture because of the 10 most valuable works of art ever sold at auction, uh, eight of the 10 were some form of portraiture. Of, of the King Philip, this is a portrait of, of his servant. And it, with all due respect to the portraits of Prince Philip, this is a better painting than those. Uh, this was his friend, not just his, uh, not just his patron. Uh, and again, it, it, this is a, a kind of private, uh, personal painting, which is which touches touches me. And but it is an, a, 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 it, it is it is a slightly aberration to what was really painted at this time. Much more to the point was a painting like this is by, I believe, Le Julier, and as I said, this is a portrait of a dress with a woman attached. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it does have a message. The message is, I am very, very, very rich. <laughs> and I'm very, very well connected. And my husband paid for this. <laughs> uh, this is a painting by Fragonard. It is a portrait, but it's 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 a it's a it's it's. Uh, I, I, what, sometimes art history gets it right. The period that this was painted in is uh, late Baroque, and late Baroque is called the Rococo, and this painting looks like a Rococo. Uh, it is frivolous. It's it's lightly painted. It's beautifully painted, but it is a little bit silly, uh, and uh, it's very much of that particular period. Uh, I often go when I at the Getty Museum and I see the uh, beautifully crafted ormolu furniture that was made for one one hundred thousandths of one percent of the population. Mm. I often understand why the guillotine was invented <laughs> um, because because it's not the craftsmen. The people who made the furniture were great; they they were terrific craftsmen. But the society that produced all that that overly ornate and very expensive furniture were not paying attention to the society they lived in, and uh, the society eventually caught up with them and said, "This is this is not going to stand." And so that that sense of uh, that sense of privilege is, is something that one one sees creeping into portraiture at the end of the 18th century. Uh, again, here's another. Uh, this is an English uh, so-called. Uh, uh, this is a uh, a painting. Uh, of, of, of a family, and again, it's 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 uh, it's it's showing their 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 wealth and their their their, their relaxation and their wealth with the husband and the wife and all the children, uh, and uh, it's called uh, these types of paintings of, of family scenes are called conversation pieces, uh, and this is very well well painted, but it, it basically is uh, a painting. Uh, it's, it's signifying power and wealth. 
Uh, in a slightly different way, uh, starting to creep into the end of the 18th century is the portraiture of, of Romanticism. And this is by the great English uh, artist, uh, Joseph Wright of Derby, and this is called, uh, called Experiment with Air Pump. We are there uh, proving that a vacuum exists by killing a dove that's in a glass sphere, as you can possibly see in the upper portion. But within the portrait is two lovers looking at each other, children being a, a, appalled by what's going on, a scientist in the background. It's a very complicated composition, beautiful painted, uh, but it's, it's, touching, uh, it's, it's touching upon not wealth or power, but science. And, uh, and, it's, and with the moon, with the moon uh, in the background, through the window, it, it's a truly kind of romantic picture. And uh, uh, things are starting to change in terms of the perception of the uh, art of that time. And it changes very dramatically with, with Goya at the end of the 18th, 18th century. This is the 1799 etching in Aquitaine called The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. And the artist, the self, it's a self-portrait of the artist Goya at his writing desk, a, a kind of sleep, and he's sleeping of the monsters that are floating through the sky uh, above. Uh, the end of the 19th, the end of the 18th century was a, was a time of uh, psychological turmoil in um, in Europe with the uh, with a great earthquake in Lisbon that killed thousands of people and uh, um, and the uh, turmoil politically in France. With the uh, at the end of the, the with the French Revolution, etc., and uh, you see it in this uh, watercolor that's in the exhibition by Thomas Rowlandson, where uh, it's not so much a portrait as a vision, a vision of of madness with all of these different faces, uh, just 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 uh, uh, and one 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 doesn't have to imagine anything here. One is seen. A, a, a portrait of madness in uh, in uh, Rowlandson's work. Rowlandson is also in the show with a rather jolly portrait of a maid with a loose blouse and her jockey boyfriend, uh, which is a very much more typical Rowlandson. Uh, but this one here is very very powerful and very uh, uh, a very menacing work of art and uh, uh, very unsaleable, which is why I bought it. <laughs> Jacques-Louis David was the greatest uh, neoclassical artist in France at the end of the 18th century. I'm happy to say that there are three portraits of, uh, of David in the exhibition, uh, two of him and one by him. And uh, here is a self-portrait that David did. D David was, was rather fortunate. He's the only person I ever knew that really uh, took the fact that he had a terrible stutter to advantage. When he got up in the, in the assembly during the revolutionary period, uh, a lot of people, if he, if, they could, he, if he had articulated his ideas more clearly, uh, he would have been guillotined, but because he had such a bad stutter, people couldn't understand what he said, and so he only ended up in prison for a little while rather than being guillotined. So, uh, and I mention this because this, in fact, is a portrait of uh, David done while he was in prison. Uh, and it was a drawing that by a, a man named Delafontaine, who was, a, uh, who was one of uh, David's pupils. And uh, he, he, uh, he gave this to David as a present, but was later shocked to find out that David had given it away to another artist named Baron Girard. Baron Girard had given a painting of Canova to David, uh, saying that this is a portrait of the greatest sculptor of his age, and I want to give it to you, the greatest painter of the age. And uh, David was so touched with that that he gave Delafontaine's portrait to, uh, gave it away to the Baron Girard. Uh, I mention this because it's all detailed on the back of the drawing. Uh, after Baron Girard died, David, uh, Delafontaine lived long enough to buy it back. So the man who did this drawing gave it to David, gave, David gave it away, and uh, eventually uh, Delafontaine got his drawing of David back. Uh, so it all ended happily. And it's all documented on the back of the drawing in very, very small French handwriting. Uh, but it's a marvelous drawing, and 
it's, uh, it's in this Roundel style that David did a number of portraits of during the French Revolutionary period. David was a great survivor. He survived the French Revolution. And he also, uh, he also uh, uh, was a artist that was quite successful under Napoleon. Uh, this is a drawing uh, which is inscribed uh, El David, first painter to the emperor up in the corner. Uh, notice there's this strange uh, shape on the right side of his face. He had an inoperable cheek tumor, which he tended to hide in his self-portraits. But this is a kind of caricature of David where the artist has actually shown that cheek tumor. Um, you can see it. Uh, it it's, 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 uh, if you know about the history of David, you know that that was, that was, that was present. And it's not a cruel self-portrait caricature, but it is a caricature nevertheless. And then finally, here is a, a drawing that David did in, um, in, uh, in Brussels uh, towards the end of his career. Uh, after Napoleon was deposed, uh, David was on the outs again as he went back and forth during his career. And the new administration said, because he was such an important artist, said to David that uh, you can stay in France and we'll continue to honor you, but you must, you would, you must uh, confess to uh, to uh, to regicide, regicide meaning the king killing of the king, and he said, "Forget it. I'm not going to do it. I'm unrepentant. I'm a Republican. The king should have gone." And so David went into exile in Brussels and took his most famous painting with him, the famous Death of Marat painting. So if you ever want to see the Death of Marat, the great uh, masterpiece of David, you have to go up to the museum in Brussels because he took the painting with him. And just never come back, and uh, he died in Brussels, and this drawing was done in Brussels in 1815, and he, he died in the 1820s. Um, this is a beautiful portrait of one of the only two portraits of a, of a black person that uh, was done and shown in the salon at the end of the 18th century. It's by a woman artist named Benoist, and uh, it's really one of the most stunning paintings in the 18th century section of the Louvre. She was a, she was a pupil of David, and uh, we, we, we know very little about the sitter. We, we know, I think, her first name, and that's about it. Uh, she's obviously a model. She, a, a, a proper, sophisticated woman would never be posed with her breast revealed, as, as you are in this. But, as, 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 as there is nakedness in the painting, her, her portrait is so, um, is so, is she so, she's so proper that, that one doesn't really feel that she's being taken that much advantage of because her, her look, uh, her look at, at her sophistication is, is amazing. Uh, it is, it's a stunning, stunting painting and, uh, but, but finding works of art that don't have uh, African Africans or Blacks uh, portrayed as anything but uh, servants or something holding the reins of horses and stuff are quite uncommon, and I never thought I'd ever find one. But I did find this particular portrait by Le Bruce, who was a miniaturist, and uh, he did this portrait of clearly a sophisticated uh, African prince that probably uh, came to Paris at some point and had his portrait done. We don't know who the prince is, but we do know who did it, Le Gros, and uh, I, I found it uh, 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 rather uh, uh, beautiful and uh, representative of uh, the type of very uncommon portrait of this particular time period. Uh, this is by uh, Jericho. Theodore Jericho, one of the great romantic painters of the age, famous for his uh, graft of the Meduse in the uh, Louvre, uh, especially paintings of horse horsemen. Uh, but he did a series of portraits of uh, psychotic patients. Uh, I think this woman is the kidnapper. He did portraits of uh, uh, three or four of these amazingly powerful portraits of people in the same asylums in the 1820s. 
and uh, it's an absolutely riveting uh, painting. And I've always admired the painting, but I never thought I'd find anything quite like it until I found this painting. And this is a painting done in the 1840s, and it's done by an artist named Richard Dad. And Richard Dad is represented by three, two, two, two other books of art in the exhibition. Uh, I often say that if Paul Mellon was still alive, I don't know, I would own no Richard Dad's because Paul Mellon, the great collector at the National Gallery and the British Museum of the, Brit the British uh, uh, Center for the Yale Center for British Art, uh, collected Dad. And, but he passed away by the time I was able to get my dad, so I didn't have him in competition. And this is a portrait by Dad. Dad was a brilliant young artist who traveled to Egypt in the 1820s with uh, Sir Thomas Phillips to be his kind of uh, uh, port, he was the man who recorded the trip through watercolors and drawings. And when he came back, he was psych psychologically off and he lured his father to a park outside of London and murdered his father, thinking his father was an evil Egyptian god. And he was sent to uh, uh, Bethlehem Hospital in London. Uh, if you ever find, if you ever wondered where the term Bethlehem comes from, Bethlehem is simply a, a Cockney phrase for Bethlehem. So Bethlehem is Bethlehem Hospital, and that was the insane asylum of its day. Today it's the Imperial War Museum the building. And he was sent to Bethlehem Hospital. Uh, he was proved to be, they didn't execute him for the murder of his father. They said he's completely nuts. And so they sent him to a, to a <coughs> facility for the criminally insane. And he later was transferred to Broadmoor Prison, which was a more, more recent uh, insane asylum. And uh, his family took pity on him because they realized he was nuts. And so they provided him with uh, drawing instruments. And so all three of the works that my show by Richard Dad were all done when he was in the insane asylum. And this particular work is this portrait. He tried to do a portrait of a woman, but he hadn't seen a woman in 17 years because they didn't allow women on the wards with these people who were, many of them were sexual deviants. And so all he could see were, were male guards. And so he fashioned this portrait of this woman as best he could from seeing male guards and, and putting, a, a, putting the, the hair on her as if it was a woman, and it's, it's, so when you saw this drawing for the first time in the exhibition and, and you felt uncomfortable, there's a reason. Um, that, that he's trying to do a woman, but he hadn't seen one in 17 years. And of course, those are all the reasons why the dealer probably hadn't sold it until I came along. <laughs> um, and it's exactly why I wanted the painting, because I find it uh, absolutely fascinating. And, uh, and, it, and I'm so glad it's in my collection. Uh, People know Delacroix, the great romantic French artist in the early 19th century. They know his kind of rival, uh, Jean-Dominique Pagne, who was the great neoclassical draftsman and uh, a very, very stiff academic artist. But uh, there's an artist that's in between them. There was an artist named Theodore Cesario who did this beautiful painting of the two sisters, his two sisters, that's in the Louvre today. And, uh, Cesario studied with Ang, was Ang's favorite pupil, and then Ang, uh, then Cesario started to become much more of a romantic artist, which upset uh, Ang, and so he's an artist that's in between Ang and Delacroix, and uh, I was able to acquire this beautiful portrait of a young man uh, by Cesario, um, and it was owned by the great John Rewald, who was the great uh, historian of Impressionism, and uh, in 19. One of the things that, that uh, again, is fascinating about portraiture is that uh, portraiture, it, it very often, is not pure fine art, but sometimes linked to science. And the photograph you see on the screen is by this fascinating artist, uh, uh, a doctor from the, from the 19th century named Duchamp de, Duchamp de Boulogne. And Duchamp de Boulogne was a scientist who was experimenting with uh, with expressions caused by elect electronic shocks to the face. And so there's a whole series of, 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 of photographs that he had taken of his subject, uh, showing various moods from, from joy to fear to a shock. And uh, this, is one of those, this is one of those photographs. In fact, the 
person on the right is, in fact, the, 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 the doctor himself, Dushan Balo, who set up the photograph. And I mention all this because in the exhibition, there is, in fact, a drawing by Dushan Balo. Besides being a doctor, he was a very good draftsman, as you can see. And this is a drawing that Dushan Balo did of many of his medical experiments. And what he found out was in publishing his medical research, it was very expensive to, to put the individual photographs of some of these models in his books. And at the end of his life, he decided to, to make his works more accessible, that he would do his own hand-drawn copies of many of the photographs and put many of the subjects in one, one, one drawing for reproduction rather than the individual photographs. And he did about five or six of these things, but unfortunately he died before uh, the project was finished and they could be published in this form. And I found one or two of these drawings in Paris a few years ago uh, that, that show his skill in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 as, a, as a draftsman of those photographs. And uh, again, the whole multidimensionality of people well-educated in the 19th century. who He was not only a successful medical doctor, but as you can see, he could have been an artist in his own right. Uh, the, in the book, in the exhibition, uh, I, I was ending the, the, the last chapter, the, 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 the book and the exhibition are divided up into five or six different sections on portraits of artists, self-portraits of artists, family portraits, famous people, etc., uh, drama and imagination, and the last section was, uh, was endings. And in endings, um, there are portraits of deceased people. Um, uh, I, I luckily decided that I wouldn't have it just, uh, just deceased people, but I'd have people sleeping. So the last photograph, the last reproduction is of a, a, an artist friend's wife sleeping, because I didn't want the, 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 the book, the catalog, to be a complete downer at the end with a bunch of dead people. Um, so I mixed those up together. But in point of fact, uh, the memorialization of people was something that, uh, that, uh, that was important to people in the 19th century, where the image was transferred to a, uh, a copper plate, a silver copper plate, through chemical, uh, chemicals, and it was the, really the first uh, true photograph, uh, which was invented in the 1839-1840. And very often, there are quite a number of daguerreotypes in existence of deceased people, especially children. And you say, oh, those are so macabre that they, 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 the, our, our ancestors were, were so macabre and, and you know, ghoulish and all, and it's not true. What happened was that today, if you were lucky enough to have a child age four or five or six who, had some, who got in an accident and died, you'd have hundreds if not thousands of photographs of that child for the first four or five years of their life, probably home movies, etc. But in the 19th century, if a child died at age four or five, very often you, they'd have no record of that child. They, they, they ran a hardware store, and here's a portrait of him and his coffin, surrounded by all the things he sold in life. And, and it's rather poignant and rather beautiful. It, it's very crude, it's a folk art drawing, but I found it an extremely, uh, extremely sincere moving and very much a take on uh, the daguerreotypes of, of, of the earlier generation and trying to capture um, capture the essence of a person even though they were no longer there. Um, the exhibition has no Matisse's, Picasso's, or Giacometti's. Not because I don't like Matisse, Picasso, or Giacometti, it's only because I haven't won the Powerball lottery. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I mentioned that, that uh, some of those artists I actually acquired for my museum over the years because my museum had, had, had the money and I was able to secure some beautiful works of art by Matisse and Picasso for the collection. But in my own case, the, the collection has been formed on a curator's salary and uh, the, 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 my, my strength was, was knowledge is power, not money is power. And so my knowledge was the thing that drove me. And that, uh, uh, 
it's not because I don't like those other artists, it's just that they were never in the cards to, uh, to acquire, and so that, that's fine. I can admire them tremendously. Uh, it's just that I could never afford them, and I really didn't want some tiny little scribble of a sketch by uh, an artist like Matisse that would not hold up, but it would be by Matisse. I'd rather not have a Matisse than have a, I'd rather not have a Matisse than have one that's just some tiny little scribble. So I, I, I respect those people, but you know, you're not gonna find those in my collection, but not because I didn't like or don't like those artists. Uh, in turn, uh, occasionally I've gotten lucky. Uh, this is a painting by uh, Edgar Degas. It's in the Louvre, it's in the Musée d'Orsay. It is, uh, it's called The Absinthe Drinker. And it's a portrait of, of two of his friends. And uh, the woman in the picture is Ellen Andre, who is an actress friend. And he talked her into uh, posing for the painting. She's sitting in front of a glass of kind of greenish, yellowish liquid, which is absinthe, which is a uh, perfect color for something that rots your brain, um, the greenish. It was actually banned in France for many, many decades because it was uh, it, it used wormwood as one of its ingredients and it rotted people's brains. So uh, the French were very worried about people, people, their soldiers having their brains eaten out uh, uh, in the prelude to World War I. Uh, so here he is picturing uh, his two artist friends sitting seated in the cafe and uh, Again, I don't think she knew that she was going to be posing uh, as a zonked out uh, drunk, but uh, that's what happens when you're a friend of Degas and he asks you to pose. Luckily, I was able to acquire uh, this portrait, a little monotype, by uh, Degas of Ellen Andre. And um, for those of you who don't know what a monotype is, a monotype is a little like a finger painting by a genius. Um, it is where you take a copper plate and you rub the ink around on the copper plate uh, in, into a design and then you run it through, you put a piece of paper over it and you run it through a press like you did with an etching or a woodcut. Except because you haven't incised anything into the copper plate, you can only print one or two impressions before the ink runs out. So it's a monotype, mono, you know, only one. And so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, a printed, it's a printed drawing, so to speak. And so, uh, this is a uh, monotype of uh, Ellen Andre. It's only about three inches high by two and a half inches. And he did it completely from a memory. Uh, I don't think she posed for it. I think he just remembered what she looked like. And it's a, it's a beautiful uh, kind of snapshotty type portrait of this woman who's a good friend of his. And uh, she's more dignified here than in the painting. Um, this is a photograph by the great uh, documentary photographer, Lewis Hine. Lewis Hine was a man who was a uh, social, social performer. He took photographs of the young boys that had to go down in the mines in Pennsylvania and, uh, and uh, of the workers and the, uh, the women, the, the little girls that had to run the giant uh, spinning meal, spinning uh, uh, machines and workshops in the South. And he was, he was a real muckraker. He, he, he pointed out the indignity of child labor in America. And he, because of his photographs that became well known, uh, laws were passed to protect children in the United States. He once said, if I could do it, if I could say it in words, I wouldn't have to carry this heavy camera around. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he carried that heavy camera around for years and took uh, amazing uh, photographs. This is a photograph not of a worker, but this is a photograph of one of the immigrants on Ellis Island coming to America for the first time. And uh, again, very poignant, very documentary. But uh, uh, you know, this, this, this is obviously somebody's uh, great-grandmother today. Uh, you know, so many of our families came through uh, Ellis Island and uh, the Golden Door, of which uh, the Statue of Liberty uh, opens, its, uh, opens its arms. And in the exhibition is this drawing by uh, Joseph Stella. Joseph Stella was an Italian-born American artist who came to America and did this drawing in 1900. And this is a drawing of a young girl at Ellis Island, which he drew. 
And so this is the drone equivalent of the photograph by Hyman we just saw. And um, again, very poignant and very touching. Uh, this was the drawing that was once owned by the famous American artist, uh, Raphael Sawyer. And um, again, I was very happy to be able to acquire it. I, again, you know, not everybody wants a portrait of a, a, a rather destitute looking little girl, but I did. <laughs> this is by um, Pierre Bonnard, and it's an unusual subject. It's not an unusual subject in movies, people crying. It's not an unusual subject in, in real life. Uh, if you have any sons or daughters when they're little, they cry when you have to go to bed, or they stub their toe or whatever, but in art, uh, weaving is a, a, is a rather uh, unusual subject matter. I've been admiring it for 20 years, even though I didn't own it, so it's now finally on the wall in the next room. And here we have uh, a painting, uh, one of probably the most famous paintings of a crying individual in the 20th century. This is the weeping woman that's owned by the Tate Gallery in uh, London, and it's a portrait of Dora Maar. And this painting was done at the time of Guernica, the famous painting that Picasso did of the Spanish Civil War. And so this was a particularly fraught time for a Spaniard like Picasso because of the atrocities that were happening in his, in his native country in Spain. And, uh, the sitter for this particular painting was his mistress at the time, the photographer and artist, Dora Mar. And in the exhibition is this portrait of Dora Mar. Dora Mar was Picasso's intellectual equal. Picasso had two lovers at the time, Marie-Therese Walter, who was this big voluptuous blonde, who probably couldn't spell cat if you gave her the C and the T. But she loved Picasso. She was very easygoing. Picasso liked to be around her. I'm sure the sex was great. And, and, but, but Dora Moore was the, was the individual that, uh, that challenged Picasso. He was, she was intellectually his equal. She was very sophisticated. And, uh, and he, he liked to be around her too because she, she challenged him and she could have, he could have very interesting conversations with her and all of that. Um, and uh, Picasso left both of them uh, for, uh, for, for uh, uh, another woman. And, uh, and uh, Marie Therese, she never got over it and she eventually committed suicide. Uh, Dora Mar, the subject of the self-portrait, she never got over it either, and she became a recluse and uh, basically never hooked up with anybody after Picasso, and she died alone uh, a few years ago. And this is a drawing uh, that the self-portrait she did probably in the 30s, and what I found amazing is that this came up in her estate sale after she died in Paris, and on the first sole of each of the halves of the sheet are still lifes that she uh, initialed, uh, DM. But she used the back, she used the, she, she, she obviously violently cut this self-portrait of herself in two and used the, the, back, the back of the sheets to do two rather mediocre still lifes. And when, when they were in the sale, somebody wisely put them in the same lot and sold them together. And I was able to acquire them. Um, I was able to acquire the self-portrait with the two civil lights on the back. It was cut with a razor blade so the two sheets could have been seamlessly put together. I could have had this conserved so that you would not know the drawing had been cut in two. But of course I didn't do that because that was, that was also a continuation of what she thought about the drawing and she thought at the time with uh, the separation, and you can see uh, this kind of violence to the sheet. Uh, it's a really beautiful drawing. Again, she didn't do it to sell or anything like that. 
In fact, she didn't even draw the completed portrait. She did it. She put her face at the bottom end of the uh, of the composition, so you don't even see the end of her uh, the end of her draw. Uh, but it's a very poignant and very beautiful uh, drawing. And again, uh, one of the things I should also say about collecting is, I often some people say, well, you know, what's your favorite work of art? And and one of the things that is really true is the favorite works of art I've the the the, the, the favorite things I've collected are the friendships and associations I've had over the years, the, the dealers I've met, the fellow collectors I've known, the scholars and historians I've met. Uh, collecting is a journey, not a destination. It, it, it's, it's not about acquiring this and acquiring that. Yes, you acquire some things. There's lots of things I've admired and not bought, uh, especially things I couldn't afford. Uh, but but the, the, the whole nature of the, uh, of the experience and, going to an exhibition and maybe there's something for sale, maybe there isn't. Um, and so the, the sense of uh, the, the, the person I bought this drawing from, I bought two or three other drawings from over the years, and she's become a very good friend, a private dealer in Paris. And so when I look at drawings like this, I not only think of the artist who did it or the subject matter, I also think of the experience of, of acquiring it. And sometimes the, 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 the effort it came to raising the money to uh, or paying it off over over time to acquire the money itself. Um, I, I just take a, a slight segue into the fact that portraiture, portraiture, the modern portrait that isn't just the portrait of the rich or powerful person, are 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 not just confined to paintings or, or drawings. They can be sculptures too. This is a portrait of uh, by Picasso. A sculpture. Uh, it's, it's Picasso's first important sculpture, and it's a cubistic portrait of Ferdinand, his 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 most important mistress at the turn of the century. And I'm not sure whether she admired her her visage here, since uh, she looks like something from a uh, Star Wars movie. But um, but it is a beautiful and powerful sculpture. She's just the beginning, not the end, as 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 I mentioned about the Gertrude Stein portrait too. And so. The nature of portraiture can also be very moving and powerful. But again, this is not about likeness. This is about art, this portrait of Ferdinand by Picasso. And this portrait of uh, Diego, uh, uh, Alberto Giacometti's brother, is also, again, uh, not, a, not a, a, a representation that would be taken as a good likeness, but it is, uh, it's 10% likeness and 90% geochemistry, just as the Picasso is too. And that's what's so great about you know, these, these portraits. The modern portrait is uh, very much as Oscar Wilde said, a portrait of the artist as much as this portrait of the sitter. Uh, this is a, a drawing I bought from one of the founders of uh, the rock and roll movement in San Francisco in the 1960s, a man named Chet Helms that put on the family dog uh, concerts for the Grateful Dead and other uh, great groups in San Francisco in the 1960s. And later he became an art dealer and he had this drawing by a man named Roger Hayward. And I saw it, uh, it's the only thing I ever bought from him, but I found it amazing. And it's a 1928 portrait of uh, a self-portrait of this man, Roger Hayward, and it's self-portrait in a coffee urn. And so you see his face and the reflection on, the, on a piece of polished metal and uh, it's, uh, it's extremely quirky, which is one of the reasons I liked it, rather large. And um, it was very fascinating. He, he was uh, from New Hampshire originally, came out to Los Angeles, became an artist. That's probably where the drawing was done. He was about 28 years old. Uh, he was born in 1900. And he later became an architect, uh, just designed the Delphi Library in Los Angeles. And later was one of the early architects of LAX, the, the airport. And so go, go figure, here's this, this kind of quirky self-portrait drawing of this man who later became uh, a distinguished Los Angeles architect. Again, he's not famous. Uh, it's just a very, very good drawing. And that's why I acquired it. This is by Charles Sims. Um, again, it's an artist that I wanted to buy, and I'd never heard of Charles Sims. Uh, I didn't know who he was. I found out later, of course, that Charles Sims was an artist who worked in a kind of Victorian 
of Victorian Johnson or Sargini Manor. He did a portrait of a, a Sir Kenneth Clark, the famous art historian, when he was a young boy. His parents commissioned Charles Sims to do a portrait of him. But World War I came along. And in World War I, he served, he was, he was uh, young enough to still be able to serve in the army, but old enough to have a son in the same army. His son was killed in combat and he was gassed. He was severely gassed in the war. His son was killed and he never got over it. And you can see he never got over it because this is a self-portrait full of tremendous anguish and hurt. And he eventually committed suicide. And for those of you who have seen the recent uh, German uh, movie, All's Quiet on the Western Front, uh, the anguish of that movie, the, the brutality of that movie, the terror and the sadness of that movie is, I think, encompassed somewhat in this portrait of Charles Sims, a self-portrait he did after his son died uh, and after he was gassed in the war and just prior to his suicide. Um, it's, it's, it's a difficult drawing, but it's a great drawing. And again, um, it's one of these works of art that I stumbled upon. Uh, I knew nothing about the artist at the time. All I knew was a great drawing and it was something that was within my means and so I find it. Um, Christian Schad uh, is a artist uh, of the so-called no or new objectivity. The most famous of the artists of this period was Otto Dix. Uh, Max Beckman also worked in this style too. And it was this uh, crisp, hard, uh, objective way of painting society in the 1920s. If any of you have seen on Netflix the uh, series called uh, Berlin Babylon, uh, this, this, which is a very kinky uh, murder mystery, uh, an excellent, most expensive uh, television series ever produced in Germany. It's the, 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 the uh, art direction is perfect. It, it captures the period perfectly. This Christian shot self-portrait of him wearing a trans transparent green uh, acrylic shirt. Uh, I mean, very strange. Uh, and with a prostitute behind him. Uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it captures that kind of uh, depravity that of, of Berlin in the 20s that, that Christopher Isherwood captured in his book, Goodbye Berlin, which later became the movie and the play Cabaret. And I point that out because in my exhibition is this drawing by an artist named Nicholas Sternberg. And Nicholas Sternberg was a Hungarian-born artist who lived in Paris. In the, in the 1930s, and this is a drawing which is carefully inscribed the Morphine Maniac in the Grand Guignol, and the Grand Guignol was a bar in Paris, and here he is uh, shooting, shooting up uh, morphine into his veins. And uh, again, it's not everybody's idea of drawing for their breakfast nook, uh, <laughs> but, but again, it's this powerful drawing. Uh, a portrait, you can see, he looks like a crazy professor, with his glasses off and his tie askew, but it's it's a really powerful drawing. Now, it's not it's not by Max Beckman, it's not by Christian Shaw, it's not by uh, George Groats. Uh, th those are artists I couldn't afford, but it's by this man Nicholas Sternberg, and it's an absolutely terrific drawing, and, and captures that same seedy element of that uh, Noah's Aquatite period of the 1920s, uh, before the rise of Hitler in Germany, and. Uh, and, uh, and in Paris, and uh, again, uh, 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 a breathtakingly difficult drawing, but still a beautiful drawing in, indeed. Self-portraits do not necessarily have to be portraits of faces. Uh, this, in fact, is a drawing that was drawn by the greatest German draftsman of the 19th century. Uh, by a man named Adolf von Menzel. Uh, Adolf von Menzel is, a, is, is considered a great artist in Germany. He's not too well known in America, but he was a great draftsman. He was a, he was a little guy. He was shorter than Jules the Trek, if that's possible. Uh, and he was uh, he had a, he he was so talented. He lived to be 90 years old. He was born in 1815, 
She was born in the age of Napoleon. He died in the age of the Wright brothers. He was born, he was 1815 to 1905. So he really had spanned the whole 19th century into the 20th century. And he was so talented, he used to paint with his right hand and draw with his left. And so this is a, this is a drawing of his, of his right hand by his left hand. And um, there's also a drawing in the show of, uh, of, of, a, uh, of an artist's wife and when they were visiting Paris from Germany, or actually from, uh, from uh, the Netherlands. And he didn't have a sketchbook with him, so he did the portrait of this old woman on the back of his business card. And so that's in the show too by Adam <coughs> um, there, there's a There's a drawing, and there's a drawing of Menzel in the exhibition by William, William <coughs> Rothenstein. Um, but this is a self-portrait. It says a portrait of his right hand by his left hand. And then this drawing here, is, this is a drawing by Maximilian Luce. And Maximilian Luce was a contemporary and friend of the great pointillist artist, Georges Seurat. And Maximilian Luce was a, uh, was part of, he, besides being a very talented pointillist artist, was also a bit of a, a political renegade. And he was considered something of a, of a uh, anarchist. And he and Felix Spaniel, the, uh, the uh, critic, were arrested or possibly throwing a bomb into some cafe at some point. They were eventually a portrait, so to speak, of, uh, by, by uh, René Magritte, the great Belgian surrealist. Uh, and he is uh, making the face of a nose, a mouth, an eye, and a balloon floating in the sky. Totally surrealist or this painting of Edward James, a collector. Edward James asked uh, Marguerite to do his portrait, so he did his portrait, um, and you don't see his face. If, if I was Edward James, I would be very, very happy with this portrait. Most people would not, but Edward James was a patron of Marguerite and understood Marguerite's uh, surrealist tendencies. And so here is a portrait of, of James uh, looking in a mirror and the reflection is not of his face, but another portrait of himself looking into some other place. It's a terrific, it's a masterpiece. Uh, but it is not everybody's idea of their, their portrait. In turn, this is a famous painting that, uh, it, it's, somebody once said, uh, Art News Magazine once uh, asked eminent art historians, who is the most overrated and underrated artist of the 20th, American artist of the 20th century? And one of my professors, uh, Robert Rosenblum uh, at, 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 uh, at NYU, said Andrew Wyeth on both cases. Mm -hmm. For the people that uh, like him, he's overrated. And for the people that disparage him, he's terribly underrated. Because he really was a very, very good artist. Uh, the problem about Andrew Wyeth, unlike Marguerite, Marguerite would paint his pictures and keep his mouth shut, and you had to figure out what you were looking at. Andrew Wyeth loved to explain his paintings. He said, oh, this person did this and this. And so he told us the story about this painting, that this is, this is, uh, this is uh, Christina Olsen, who is crippled, and she's sitting in this field, but she, she had to crawl back up to her house on her arms and hands and knee, knees because she was crippled. And so, we, you know, it's TMI, too much information. You know, he, did, he took the mystery out of his painting by telling us too much of the story. And, and, and by what Matisse once said, he said, if you want to be a great artist, the first thing you should do is cut off your tongue. <laughs> um, this is another self-portrait. Do you all know who did this? Jim Dine, absolutely, Jim Dine. This is a self-portrait. Jim Dine, rather than doing a portrait of his face, Jim Dine's sense of self-portraiture was the bathrobe, and, and that became a signature of his, of, of his sense of self-portraiture in the 1960s and, and later. And, and uh, again, it's, 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 it's modern art that, that uh, uh, we can't look at it anymore. One of the things, there's certain paintings like the Mona Lisa uh, portrait and uh, Whistler's mother portrait that we've hugged to death. We first hug it to death so it drops, it drops dead to our feet, or then we start making fun of it. You know, all the, the parodies of the Mona Lisa, the parody of uh, 
this has been used in Coca-Cola and, and uh, Hershey, Hershey's candies ads and stuff like that, that we don't see it anymore. And it, it really is a very beautiful portrait, a very poignant portrait of an artist's love of his mother. And she, she is playing. Uh, but but, but uh, it is, it is a, it's, a, it's a lovely painting. It's the, it's the first painting that was acquired by Whistler uh, by the French museums. Uh, and so it's, it's not in America, it's in the, it's in the Musée d'Orsay. And, and it's a lovely painting. There's a, the, the painting, the, the print on the wall is, um, is an action by Whistler. So he's got, it's a painting, it's a, it's a, a Whistler within the Whistler. Uh, and I show this because this is a portrait by Lucien Ford of his mother. And there are um, three drawings by Lucien Ford in the show. Uh, and uh, this drawing used to be in the show. This drawing, and this drawing used to be in the show. Uh, but uh, two of the drawings that I had, I decided uh, about a year or so ago to sell. I didn't sell them because I needed the money. I sold them because uh, I wanted the money to go to my children. Uh, I also wanted to make sure that my son Nicholas and my daughter Tanya realized that as much as I love Lucian Ford, I love them more. <laughs> and that my son, who was a combat helicopter pilot in, uh, and with three tours in Iraq, uh, and he's in his 40s now, he's never owned a house, and he needs some help to buy a house. And I felt it's only fitting that um, that these drawings were acquired. I love them, but as I said, I love my children and grandchildren more, and so uh, I parted with them. Uh, but it's not as if I'm bereft. There's, as I said, there's three other Lucian Freuds in the exhibition uh, still, one of which he, he Lucian gave me because I was friends with Lucian. I wrote a book about him and did the first traveling show of his works in America. But uh, uh, I show this drawing because. It is, uh, again, a very poignant picture of an artist uh, portraying your mother. Uh, this is a portrait, a self-portrait of Francis Bacon. Uh, Francis Bacon did self-portraits. He said he hated his face, but sometimes there was nobody else to paint, and so he painted himself. Uh, and uh, even with, when his paintings were of other people, the other people were never in, in person. Unlike somebody like Lucian Ford that did all of his works of art from a model, uh, Francis Bacon only worked from photography. He never, never had a sitter in to his studio to paint. Um, but it's a, a powerful and poignant uh, work, a uh, very damaged uh, self-portrait, as you can see. And here's, uh, here's Lucian Ford. This is the kind of damaged Lucian Ford. This is a painting of Lucian Ford. Lucian Ford was coming back from some appointment and he got into an argument with a cab driver and the cab driver punched Lucien in the, in the face and gave him a black eye and Lucien canceled his appointment for the rest of the day and started painting the self-portrait of himself with a black eye mm -hmm. and the painting disappeared for, I don't know, 45 or 50 years and eventually turned up recently and uh, sold for a lot of money in auction but this is when the painting was coming up for auction and, uh, uh, Again, Lucian was so fascinated with his, his own face all disfigured that he couldn't resist doing his own portrait. And then this is the other drawing that I saw. This is a, uh, this is a drawing called Ben with Head Wound. And uh, uh, I asked Lucian about it at the time that I acquired it. And he said it was a friend of his who was an ex-jockey who didn't always ride to win, mm. meaning he was susceptible to throwing races. Um, so uh, this drawing has a, has, a, has, a, has a history, as they say. Uh, poignancy. This is a small portrait of, of uh, Carpeau, who was one of the greatest sculptors of his age. This is a drawing study for a painting, self-portrait, of uh, Carpeau that's in the Musée d'Orsay. And uh, it's a sad, sad painting. This is a very sad drawing. And it's a drawing of anguish because Carl Pro was dying of cancer in his 40s when he did this drawing. And uh, it's just a small sketch, but it's, it's, uh, it's very, very moving and, uh, and powerful. And uh, it's one of the first portraits that I acquired from my collection. And this is a portrait of a man named DeWitt Hardy. 
1940 to 1917. DeWitt was like my older brother, a brother from a different mother. He was uh, a number of years older than me, seven or eight years older than me, and uh, I became friends with him when I was just a teenager. I actually uh, sold my surfboard to buy my first DeWitt Hardy watercolor. Mm -hmm. That's how much I liked his work. And we became friends for the rest of his life, and I did a retrospective of his works with a beautiful catalog at Bates College up in Maine a couple of years ago after his death, although he and I were working on the retrospective when he passed away. In, in the 1870s, and when Napoleon III, Napoleon III, a band of La Lune a newspaper, they came out with a new newspaper two weeks later called Blue Eclipse. And at that point, the, uh, the, the royalty decided just to let it go. And it was kind of like the old New York Observer, that if you were caricatured on the front page of the New York Observer, it means you'd, you'd made it in Manhattan. And so being caricatured by Le Clips and Le Lune meant that you were somebody, uh, either in politics or the arts or science or, 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 or other review of books, who did uh, many beautiful caricatures of uh, literary artistic uh, people in the New York Review of Books for like 40 years. And uh, David and I, I did a show called The Political Pet of David Levine in 1984 when the Democrats came to uh, San Francisco to nominate, uh, to nominate uh, 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 Walter Mondale to go down with the ship against Reagan in the 1984 uh, uh, election that year. And uh, I had a show of, of, uh, of Levine's works. And, I almost got fired over the poster because the poster was a Reagan in a tuxedo thumbing his nose at the American people. And the trustees, the conservative trustees, were not happy about it uh, being the poster until a friend of Reagan's got up on the trustees and said, I know Reagan, and he would not be unhappy with this. He's, he's a big boy, and he's used to being in politics. And uh, so the poster occurred. And later, uh, uh, Ron and Nancy Reagan got a copy of the poster and liked it very much, so there we are. And, and that trustee was right, and I saved my job. Um, and this is a self-portrait. David and I were close enough that he sold me his only caricature self-portrait of himself, which made his dealer extremely furious. Uh, but uh, this is a portrait of David Levine uh, himself as, uh, as the purveyor of these great caricatures. An amazing artist. I miss him. He died a few years ago. And I miss him dearly. <laughs> and when you talk about caricature, here's an artist, Philip Gustin, who has a show that's just opened at the National Gallery in Washington. And Philip Gustin, Philip Gustin was an artist who uh, painted was the most lyrical and beautiful abstract expressionist painter of abstractions in the 1950s. And, and by the end of the 1960s, he said to himself, during the Vietnam War and the, uh, and the assassinations of, of the Kennedys and Martin Luther King, I can't go into the studio anymore and paint uh, pictures of a little blue next to a little gray next to a little white. I can't do it anymore. And he started doing these kind of caricature type paintings. Uh, this is a self-portrait smoking in bed. Uh, he did paintings having to do with the Ku Klux Klan because as a child he was scared by the Ku Klux Klan growing up in Los Angeles where he saw marches of the Ku Klux Klan. And he, 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 everybody thought he'd lost his mind completely doing these types of paintings. They said he was uh, wasting his time and he should go back to painting his, his polite uh, abstractions. And he persevered with this type of painting by the time he died in 1980. These paintings were considered masterpieces, his great late work. And, uh, and so the nature of caricature and, and portraiture uh, does not necessarily have to be likeness, and it doesn't even have to be handsome. It can be difficult, like this self-portrait of the artist in bed smoking, and be considered a masterpiece in today's art. And then finally, we have uh, a work by Robert Crumb. Again, I was like, unlucky enough to know Robert. Robert is the artist, uh, is the most famous artist in the so-called underground comics of the 1960s. Many of you know who he is uh, from, uh, uh, from, his, from his characters in the cartoons. He is the Daumier of our age. He is uh, uh, an amazing artist. 
he did this in France. I was sitting next to him. Uh, he ordered a meal in, in France in a little country restaurant. He flipped the paper menu over and did this drawing between ordering the food and the food arriving. <laughs> And uh, uh, it's like a total stream of consciousness. It was like sitting next to Robin Williams rifting. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was like the visual equivalent of being next to Robin Williams rifting. And this just poured out of him. I, I wasn't having a conversation. The only thing about it is the uh, up in the corner, you see the, uh, the woman at the top. That's his wife, Eileen, who sadly just passed away uh, a few months ago. And you see the, the pig below, the wild boar. Well, that related to what happened that day when, I, when he picked me up in Nîmes to drive back to his little village outside in southern France, that his wife and a friend were driving back to the village uh, after going to grocery shopping or whatever in their Peugeot, and it was a French hunting day in France, and uh, the hunters had chased a giant 500-pound wild boar across the path of their car, and the car hit it and totaled the car. Luckily, they were wearing seatbelts, and the uh, and the, uh, 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 they were saved, but their car was demolished. And the large wild boar staggered a few steps back into the forest and collapsed and died. And uh, so they, they took the wild boar and brought it into the village and divided up the meat for everybody in the village. Uh, but that's not the end of the story. Eileen Crum, Crum's wife, was, uh, was honored as the hunter of the year in that part of France. <laughs> It was a death by Peugeot. <laughs> uh, and, and, and because it was a hunting day in France, the hunting association paid, paid the crumbs for a new car. <laughs> so it was come up at Oswald and Enswell in that in the story. But uh, uh, I, I, I had crumb, by, by the way, after dinner that night, he gave me the drawing, uh, which was very generous of him. And uh, uh, that's one of the things, again, about being a collector is uh, having these memories of the interactions with the artists, in my case, but also with the dealers and the friends and all of that. And then closing, I just want to say, I ended one of my essays in the catalog with a, a quote about, well, why portraits? Well, you know, well, to me, people are the most interesting thing. Uh, I love landscapes. I love still lifes. I love some of the abstractions, but I like, I'm interested in people. I understand, I'm interested in the people beyond just, just, the, just the physiognomy. And uh, I'll leave you with a quote by the great English poet, W.H. Auden, who said something that I wish I had said. And if it was Oscar Wilde, somebody would have said, he would have said, he would have said it even if he hadn't thought of it. Um, but this is what W.H. Auden said. To me, art's subject is the human clay and landscape but a background to a torso. All Cezanne's apples I would give away for one small Goya.